fourth year with us uh, today. Okay, we're being recorded. Um, so thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for everybody here uh, uh, who are here uh, coming in now. I'll let my colleague, uh, Richard Turner, Dr. Richard Turner, uh, give us a more formal introduction uh, to Dr. Curtis. Thank you. Thank you. All right, it's, it my, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Edward Curtis as a presenter in uh, the Department of Religious Studies, Race and Religion Lecture Series. And this is a series in which we have um, invited the authors of, of some of the, um, the most um, wonderful books in the field of race and religion to present um, in our department. And um, Dr. Edward Curtis is a professor of religious studies and um, William M. and Gail M. Plater, chair of liberal arts at Indiana University Purdue University in Indianapolis. Um, he is also the author of numerous books in the fields of um, Islam in America and African-American um, religious history. And um, these books include, of course, um, Muslims of the Heartland, which he's going to talk to us about today, but um, also Muslim American, Muslim, uh, American Politics and the Future of U.S. Democracy, which is uh, a wonderful book that I've, I've read, The Practice of Islam, um, Bloomsbury Reader on Islam in the West, The Call of Bilal, Islam in the African Diaspora. Uh, he is the editor of the Encyclopedia of Muslim American History is also um, written Muslims in America, a short history. He is the co-editor of New Black Gods, Arthur Huff Fawcett and the Study of African-American Religions, um, editor of the Columbia Source Book of Muslims in the United States, author of Black Muslim Religion in the Nation of Islam, 1960 to 1975, and um, his first book, um, Islam in Black America, Identity, Liberation, and Difference in African-American Islamic Thought, which I, I was, um, had the privilege of um, reviewing for, I think it was, what was it, American Historical Review was mm -hmm. one of those yes. mainstream American yes. uh, history journals. And, um, and um, Edward is also a, 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 one, a wonderful friend and, um, and extramural uh, colleague that I've uh, collaborated with um, on a lot of different levels over the years. So it's great to see you, Edward, and, um, and we'll let you um, present Muslims well, of the Heartland, which was published by New York University Press. And, and is it um, this year, 2022? Yes, February 2022. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, Dr. Richard Turner, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Thanks to all of you for the invitation. I just want to echo um, uh, Richard's comments about our long association. I remember when I was publishing uh, Islam of Black America in 2002, I was a little concerned because it was very much in the same territory as Richard's um, uh, path-breaking book, uh, The uh, Islam and the African-American Experience, Indiana University Press. And um, you wouldn't believe, or maybe you would believe because you know him, um, how welcoming, supportive, inclusive he was. He was rather than seeing me as some sort of you know competition or something like that, or as he was just so encouraging. And I have seen him do this uh, at conference after conference, where he gives really concrete and encour encouraging uh, advice as the respondent to different people's uh, papers. But I, you know, it was it, because of that reason I've always. Um, reached out to him for advice and counsel, and and it's just been it's one of those really 
um, for me, it's been such a wonderful uh, collegial relationship where it reminds you that, you know, we, we really, um, this business can, can uplift us as human beings just as much as it can, you know, uh, 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 help us uh, write fantastic books and create uh, important knowledge. So, so thank you for this now two decades long collaboration, uh, Richard. I don't yeah. want to age us too much, but uh, no, uh, no. Well, yeah. I regard you as a as a genius, as a person well, that's, um, who, that's very who, kind. who no, produces. I, I'm I'm serious. <laughs> produces so many wonderful books, and um, I have read most of them. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, Richard. I really do. And I also just want to shout out Sister Sister Dr. Christie, who um, who comes from the uh, just like me from the same population we're going to talk about today. And she's uh, um, and I also is uh, have been a colleague for a long time, a fellow Americanist, um, and um, I'm hoping that this is. I, I think Christy might begin to explore her own Syrian Lebanese roots in some way, shape, or form from the region, maybe in Northern yeah. Indiana, right? And yeah. <laughs> uh, looking forward to that. So, so it's really nice that, um, to kind of reconnect after um, a couple of years of pandemic disconnection. All right, um, so thank you. Let me get into it a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna go quickly through these slides because I've been asked to just talk for 30 minutes. And then, um, and then we'll open it up for conversation, for comments, questions, ideas. Um, all right, uh, so this is a book I have written for a broad audience. Um, and um, my, the main theorist of the, and can everybody see the, the slide? Yes. Right. Okay, wonderful. Uh, is not Baudrillard or Althusser or even Robert Orsi, the main theorist, uh, is Cassie Hamoe Moses Safa Kafri, my maternal grandmother, who was who really gave me, who brought me up with the stories that I needed to know about in order to understand that these Syrian Muslim communities uh, and, and Christian communities, but I write about the Muslim communities, were more than a bunch of disconnected towns. They were an, they had a regional identity. Uh, of course, they had overlapping identities, but there was truly a, uh, a Syrian Muslim Midwest. And I knew this because my grandmother told me exactly how it all worked. I am talking about a small, a relatively small group of people in this book. Um, they came from, they arrived, uh, the first and second generations of Arabic speaking Syrian and Lebanese people, uh, 100,000 of them arrived from the Eastern Mediterranean at the same time that millions of immigrants were coming from Southern Europe and Eastern Europe uh, to the United States. Uh, at this time, one out of every five Syrian Lebanese were living abroad. And um, they, um, only 100,000 of them came to the United States. The majority went to Latin America and the Caribbean. It's over 100,000 went to Brazil and 100,000 to Argentina. Uh, the people in my book, this is a modern map which shows you where they're from. But when they came, there was no Lebanon. Lebanon was created by the Sykes-Picot Agreement between the French and the British and who were the victors out of World War I. And so um, uh, that, that line you see between Lebanon and Syria is one that would come later. They came mainly from these villages. And these are the villages that, that many Iowans uh, of uh, Syrian descent came from as well. Why the Midwest? Well, this railroad map from 1901 helps to, is part of the story. First of all, they could get here. It was possible to get here. Second of all, the, um, the, the railroads tell you about the kind of uh, opportunities that, that they had. Many of them, an, um, an inordinately large number of them were peddlers. And they could, they could um, and the railroad and the rivers um, allowed them to, uh, pro to get to where they're going, but also markets. So that they could, so that they could, if you will, thinking about these as markets, 
They could come to Cedar Rapids and then by foot and then by horse and then finally by motor car, they could go visit rural communities all over the state and uh, peddle their, uh, develop relationships and peddle their wares. They also worked in factories, but it was this, the railroad map shows you, and just as a reminder, the Midwest was really the economic powerhouse of the country at the time. That's why the 1893 Chicago World's Fair was in Chicago. Uh, this, was a, that's, this was a time of enormous agricultural and industrial growth in the United States and the Midwest was at the heart of that. So that's why they came here, opportunity. You see, just trying to get. Uh, they, they, came, they, in addition to being peddlers, they were also uh, workers in places like Michigan City, right on, um, uh, on uh, the Indiana border. These are the Muslims. Now, the majority of Syrian Lebanese people who came were Christian, but a larger number overall of Muslims came to the Midwest, uh, especially to the upper Midwest. There were hundreds and, uh, and hundreds, I don't know exactly how many, of Mus Syrian Muslims who came to Michigan City and worked at Indiana's largest employer, the Haskell Barker uh, Rail Car Company, which produced rail cars, including this beautiful little caboose that you see. One of the sources I used to trace their whereabouts um, were city directories from the time. Uh, but this was, I always had to, um, as a researcher, I always had to figure out who was who, because as you can see from this list, there were four J Ali's. I mean, and these are, you know, Ali, 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 Ali. And uh, there were three Samuels. So it was sometimes hard to tell one Ali from another, um, you know, and so the, I had to get, I had to use other sources in order to do that. Why the Midwest continued? Well, one of the main families and one of the main characters in my, uh, in my book is Aliyah Ogdi Hassan, who would become arguably the most important uh, Arab American Muslim female leader of the 1960s. And she was born uh, in South Dakota. And this is a family picture of Ali, her dad, who went also by Ali and Alec and Fatima, her mom. And I don't know which one is um, Aliyah and which one is her brother here, but this is, but they, but their story really, I follow Aliyah's story through the whole book and, it, and, she, and her story in so many ways um, amplifies uh, the, um, the overall themes of the book. To trace Ali, you know, I used um, to figure out what, what it was like uh, I, I used a Sanborn insurance maps. If you look at the upper left corner of that Sanborn insurance map, those, that's where in those yellow buildings, those wood frame buildings, he lived right on the Great Sioux River, right next to a bridge outside of his house. He had almost anything you'd need. This is, he came first, like so many people, he came first and then, and he lived in a boarding house. It helps to know some Arabic because you can tell it's not exactly Ogdi, it's Ogda in the middle of, this, of the um, census there. And his name is Alec, not A uh, Ali. Um, so uh, this, these are the kind of sources that I used in addition to oral histories in order to recapture their lives. And as much as possible, I wanted to make readers feel, smell, hear, and see what the characters were doing. So the reason why uh, the Ogdi family is so important is because so many of these Muslims, as well as Christians, but the Muslims in my book came to the Dakotas uh, right after the land had been taken uh, away from the fort, the, the tr Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1868 had been canceled by the US Congress. And own, this land was only surveyed and made available to homesteaders in 1890. So Iowa had effectively been homesteaded by that time. There wasn't 160 acres available. So you had to go west if you wanted the free land. And so these, um, so, so the Ogdes went to Kadoka. Now you notice, if any of you have been to the Badlands, 
this is, Kadoka is the gateway to the Badlands. You can imagine how hard it is to farm that land. That land's not really good for intensive agriculture. It's, it's used for grazing and really it shouldn't be used at all. But, uh, but, but this is what they came. So you see this map of the Dakotas on the left, all of this land in, on the left of the map is taken from uh, the Sioux people and other Native American nations and then, the, and, and then given to homesteaders who are willing to prove up, um, that is to cultivate the land, build and build a simple home. Oftentimes all these people could afford were tar paper shacks, like you see 10 by 12, tar paper shacks, like you see in the, uh, in the picture, in the illustration there. So this was a rough way to, um, to make a living. But he did it, let's see here. He proves up, uh, but, not without, uh, but not without his marriage almost falling apart. At one point, uh, Fatima uh, is, is, is hanging the wash and her, uh, and her kids are, and her dog are, are sitting near her and a rattlesnake comes and approaches them. And uh, this is the story that starts the book. And um, uh, the first line of, the, of that chapter is the rattlesnake was the final straw. So it, 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 the rattlesnake kills the dog, and, but she then kills the rattlesnake before it gets to the kids. Uh, and she issues Ali an ultimatum. Either I'm moving to Sioux Falls or I'm, I'm going back to Syria. Your choice. So he moves to Sioux Falls. And that's where... Aliyah would grow up. So just to put a, a bow on that, the combination then of land taken away from Native American peoples put into, uh, in, 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 used for intensive agricultural purposes, by the way, makes North Dakota the largest single state producer of wheat in the country. Hard to imagine now, but it, it, but it was in, by 1910. And then... Um, and, and then that agricultural surplus fuels the, the industrial revolution along the Great Lakes, in part through things like the refrigerated rail car, which allows for meat, fresh meat, to be refrigerated and shipped long distances. So that's when you have all the meat, uh, Christy, this is when you have all the meat packing plants really you know, coming uh, about, because now we can ship them before you had to salt the pork. Now we, can, now we can ship the fresh pork and, the, and, and other um, live, uh, freshly uh, butchered livestock else, elsewhere. Okay, so, that, so, there, so the agricultural and the industrial uh, expansion are deeply related in the Midwest and Syrians help to tell that story. Do, um, of course I look for discrimination. Do Syrian Muslims face discrimination? Well, Always socially, they do. They, 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 there's no, it doesn't go away uh, uh, during the entire period covered by my book in World War II. Um, uh, but legal, it depends on the locality. So for the purposes of the homestead, in the Dakotas, they are white people. They are listed as white people. So they are legally white until... 1908, 1909, the, uh, the Secretary of Commerce and Labor rules that Syrians are actually not white and directs all the naturalization ceremonies going on, naturalized citizens to, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny how race can change that quickly, right? And um, the, uh, that the um, directs, sends federal marshals to the courts throughout the Midwest to try to stop naturalization ceremony saying, because under US laws, unless you were, you, you were white or African, you were not uh, eligible for naturalized citizenship. The African part came as part, of the, um, as part of radical reconstruction. The original law was that free white persons, 1790 law, was only they could naturalize. So, so, but remember that this is after the Chinese Exclusion Act. So all Asians, including Syrians who are from Asia, are ineligible, says the Secretary of Commerce and Labor. All right, this is when people in Cedar Rapids, including big important Republicans, start saying, wait a minute, we know the Sharonics. 
we know all these people, they're important people in our community. We know, um, uh, and, and you, this is completely improper. And they start, so the town figures start standing up for Syrian naturalization. So see, it, it really does depend on, um, it really does depend on the time and the place. In 1915, the Dow decision, um, I think it's in the Fourth Circuit Court uh, of Appeals, uh, rules that Syrians are actually white and thus eligible for citizenship. Yeah. That doesn't stop the social discrimination, but it does settle the question, at least in terms of federal law, of whether they're racially white. And that's why to this day, uh, Middle East, North Africans don't have a separate race on our US census because this was something that my ancestors fought very hard for. They wanted to be on the white side of the color line. They got their wish. Um, little did they know how, what the repercussions might be over time for that. And we can talk more about that if you'd like. Okay, so it, um, so it depends on time and place. Cedar Rapids, before World War I, Syrians are often seen as another white ethnic uh, immigrant group. City officials defend whiteness and citizenship eligibility against federal prosecution. One reason my book argues is the importance of the Bohemian or the Czech and Slovak minority. For those of you who are familiar with the history of Cedar Rapids, you know that by the late 1800s, Czech and Slovak people were teaching their kids how to speak Czech. They, were, they had their own ethnic associations and churches. They were a powerful minority fueling the growth of Cedar Rapids as a boom town in the late 1800s. They had, and there were, um, they set the stage for a multi-ethnic, a multi-ethnic white town. By the way, for African Americans and native peoples, they are not afforded the same privileges. But at this point, Syrians and Lebanese are included in white ethnic identity in Cedar Rapids, I argue because of the Bohemians. It's very different in Michigan City and Indiana. Before World War I, Syrians are people of color subject to police violence as well as social and legal discrimination. They're workers. Haskell Barker Railroad Car Factory employs more Arabs in 1915 than Henry Ford does, which is surprising to some people. And, uh, but the reason why John Barker recruits them is he figures they're really bad English speakers and they won't be able to help form a union. So he tries to recruit a working class that can't speak to one another to try to prevent unionization. And then here in my home, oh, well, my home state's Illinois, but here in Christie's home state, I don't know where you grew up, Christy, but. <laughs> Gary, Gary, huh? Indiana. Oh yes, here in Christie's home state, we're a right to work state. So, you know, we, we have a long history of, of, of not uh, liking unions very much. So um, Syrian, like other people of color, what, some of the Syrians cannot occupy public space except in some exceptional circumstances. And you guessed it, they can be entertainers and they can be sports people. They can wrestle or do other sports for the entertainment of white people. Um, and so they develop, there is a whole, Syrian Muslim gymnasium that produces young wrestlers in Michigan City. And there's a whole fan club and or fan base for Yusuf Hussein, who's known as the Terrible Turk, one of like 15 to 20 guys who's been called the Terrible Turk in the history of wrestling. But he, he um, when I saw he had a fan club in Michigan City, they were really big into wrestling. Uh, unfortunately, Indiana does not have cheerleading at its wrestling matches like Iowa does which I think is, a, is, is a, another reason why Iowa is probably better than Indiana. But, you know, um, we can talk about that later about Iowa wrestling. When I saw this guy, I was like, that's my grandfather. I mean, he does it. The face is different. But, this, but, but among these men, you know, feats of strength and agility were very much valued. And uh, they, were, they loved to uh, do swords play um, from Iowa to Indiana. And both my grandfather and his brother were recruited by Rock, uh, Newt Rockney to, uh, to play football at Notre Dame. And, you know, so Syrians were known, this is a long time, there are a lot of Arab Americans who have been involved in the history of, of football. 
uh, uh, and so I'm not surprised. This wasn't completely surprising to me. Takeaway, World War I is a turning point in the political lives of Syrian Muslims in the Midwest, even in, even in Michigan City, Indiana. The very first conscript or draftee uh, in Michigan City is a Syrian Muslim, Muhammad Dabodja or Dabeja. And you see this uh, fantastic picture here of Muhammad signing his draft papers. Uh, and, and, and so a lot of Syrian Muslims serve. And one of them becomes the de facto correspondent in the field for the local newspaper, guy named Joe, one of those Joe Ali's. Remember those four Joe Ali's? that we saw before. And um, Joe Ali helps to integrate the beach for Syrians, not for black people, but for Syrians. He, he sues because the bathing house denies him a, a, a bathing suit. You know, bathing suits were expensive and you know, more like Spanx or something, um, you know, than, than, uh, than the kind of bathing suits we wear today. So you could go rent one. And, um, but they denied it and they overheard someone say, you know, we're not going to give that Turk, which is what they were calling the Syrian Muslims, a bathing suit. So he sues and a jury of his white peers awards him some money, says that they were wrong. And this then becomes a legal precedent to open up the beach to Syrian Lebanese people in Michigan City, uh, in part because Joe Ali is a veteran and, you know, and, and, and the service, this military service becomes a passport to social uh, citizenship in addition to political citizenship. Another takeaway in my book is, between World War I and World War II, Muslim religious congregations, like other Midwest congregations, built social, uh, cultural, and political powers. They were pathways, not impediments to assimilation. And this argument is, is um, counterintuitive to people who are not in, um, who don't study American religion, but it's, it's not a particularly original argument for those in American religion. We know if we study Midwest uh, religion, we know that the, the holding on to ethnicity is actually a way of participating in American life. I mean, everybody has to form their ethnic religious congregation in order to participate in public life uh, from philanthropy to politics, right? That's just how the Midwest especially the Midwest, but the rest of the country also works. And so between World War I, the very first mosque built by Muslims for Muslims, it's not the first mosque, the first mosques were in the 1890s in New York and Chicago, but uh, the first mosque built by Muslims for Muslims, first Highland Park, it's not unfortunately the mother mosque in, in uh, I, uh, people in Cedar Rapids were, some of them were disappointed, others were, uh, were um, fascinated that what they had been told that theirs was the first mosque. Just, I mean, this, this, this is, this is a timestamp signature. It's in a newspaper, uh, you know, timestamp. So we have the, the physical evidence that there was a mosque in Highland Park in 1921. Uh, in Ross, North Dakota in 1929, looks more like an outbuilding. Uh, Michigan City, Indiana, this was not purpose built, but Asr al-Jadid, was established in 1931, and then Cedar Rapids in 1934, the Mother Mosque, which says Muslim Temple or El Nadi El Islami, the Islamic Club. In Cedar Rapids and across the Midwest, um, the, the neighborhood Syrian grocery was an institutional pillar of the community. And this is why during the Great Depression, the community had enough money to, buy, to, to purchase or build mosques because the grocery was basically, you know, a, the, a preeminent community banking uh, institution. It, it, was the la it was the place where you could actually go get credit. And then where you would bring your paycheck, uh, you know, if you had one, uh, to you, the first place you would bring your paycheck and you'd pay your bill. So these grocery stores are still generating income during the Great Depression. And Cedar Rapids is quite known for its Syrian and Lebanese groceries, uh, was anyway, uh, uh, like many towns. Uh, one of the things that um, is interesting to note is that the same people who built the mosque are also people who sold uh, 
pork and beer at their, at their Muslim-owned grocery stores. It's important not to read back into time what is of concern today sometimes. It's just their definition of what it meant to be a good Muslim oftentimes had less to do with personal piety and more to do with knowledge, with the cultivation of knowledge, and also uh, with raising their kids as a strong community and an identity. And, you know, it's anyone who's familiar with the Arab world knows, I mean, we all went through a global religious revival in the 1970s. And, you know, this, this issue of not drinking became much more important. I mean, and anyone who's been raised in the Midwest, we remember, we grew up with religious people who did not drink, Baptists, Muslims, whoever. But there were also, you know, there were also always people who did. And it just wasn't the kind of dividing line between being a good or a bad Muslim that it can be, not always, but that it can be today. They had enough money to have some leisure. They, they got together, they would travel far distances on the newly built roads in the 1920s and 30s to get together to mourn each other's dead, to go to weddings, and just to get together, to, to lodge together on the shores of Lake Michigan, in Michigan City. And you see these multi-generations. Uh, there are flapper girl hats and hijabs or headscarves here. There are fedoras, there are newspaper boy hats and this beautiful picture in the 1930s of, um, of the, uh, of this ihtifal, this gathering of the Jamiat al Asr al Jadid al Islami, this gathering of the of the uh, new generation or new era Islamic society, with guests from Detroit, various places across the Midwest who would come uh, to to be together, listen to Arabic poetry, uh, uh, eat Arab food, um, you know. Uh, kibbe and tabule and the you know Levantine foods and enjoy each other's company. So to, to drive home this idea that they were that that they that they were the second generation was fully assimilated and also fully Muslim, fully American. Abe, Abe Hamid is a great example from Fayette, Iowa, just north of you all, and probably close to where Maureen grew up. And um, so uh, when I first showed this to my mother-in-law from Garner, Iowa, she said, every single boy I've ever known has a picture like that, uh, you know, who was a part of 4-H. And all the Hammond children were part of 4-H. But, but Abe Hammond grew up in a place where, in addition to going to 4-H, his, his um, father and mother stressed, the, and his mother was very Islamically educated, stressed the importance of knowing the Quran and learning the Quran, and they had, no one knows where this is, this, this, this volume of the Quran is, but this would have been the, probably the oldest volume of the Quran in Iowa and maybe in the Midwest and in the United States. It was already 150 years old when they brought it over. So it would have been a hand you know, uh, made Quran, not a printed one. And um, so this would be the family Quran that they learned from. And uh, there was a large movement um, to document some of this when the University of Iowa established its religion department, because this really embodied the whole idea that the Rockefellers wanted to embody in terms of religious diversity. So some, a couple of professors eventually went to the mosque and recorded the call to prayer. I've been looking for it, but I never have found it. It might be in your library somewhere. Again, in Iowa, I mean, it's, it's funny how some things get better and some things get worse. I remember there was a lot of concern over having Barack Obama visit a mosque when he was president because people would see him as somehow the enemy. Well, in 1937, the Iowa Secretary of State was the headliner at the third anniversary of the mosque. Uh, to me, uh, I read this piece of evidence as indicating a high degree of acceptance for Islam as a public religion as part of the Iowa mosaic of religions, uh, you know, at that time. That's not to say that things don't get worse or that, you know, or that things don't change. 
But these, just like the Bohemians, just like the Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jews in Cedar Rapids, uh, just like the uh, even uh, the spiritualists. I mean, there were a lot of metaphysical groups in Cedar Rapids at the time. There was a, a pretty high degree of um, of acceptance here when this is featured. When you get a high-ranking state official to headline your event. Final uh, thought here before we conclude, and thank you for your patience. Um, the fate of these communities largely depended on historical forces like agricultural and economics and industrial growth, not any lack of individual effort or desire of the communities to sustain their congregations. So for example, in North Dakota where they built that mosque, they worked as hard as anybody. It's just that remember that after World War II, North Dakota goes through massive depopulation. There's no industrialization in North Dakota. The Western North Dakota cannot sustain intensive agriculture. It has to be used as grazing and, some, and a federal land program during the depression actually buys the land and turns it into federal lands. So, um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't remember all of these Syrian Muslim men that you see here taking care of their kids. Yes, Muslim men love their kids too. I know I don't have to say that to you, but, I, but given the media, uh, sometimes the idea that somehow, you know, that's the that Arab people and, and Muslim people don't, men are somehow not caregivers. This is just incorrect, <laughs> even in the old days. And um, uh, those of us who have had Arab fathers know that's true. You know, we know and Arab grandfathers, we know how much they, lo they have loved us and cared for us. So, um, so this beautiful picture, all of these Muslim farmers, um, they had to go seek jobs elsewhere. And, and, and uh, Mary Juma um, on your right, um, she was one of the first, uh, she, was a, she was a homesteader and a peddler, settled and she had her kid Charlie around 1903. He ended up being a very important source for me to understand what happened in North Dakota because he recorded an oral history. But they couldn't sustain that. So they go from, from North Dakota and from Michigan City and Sioux Falls, this is Sergeant Ali Joseph Said from Michigan City. And this is a grown up Aliyah Ogdi Hassan, who at the age of 15 moves to, uh, moved to the Detroit area. They all go to Metro Detroit, which becomes the capital of the Arab Muslim Midwest uh, and remains so. Um, but it's, it's a Midwestern, the, the success of Arab Detroit is a, is, is a Midwestern story because these people all, they bring their capital, they bring their knowledge, they bring, um, uh, they bring so many resources and they help to create Detroit into a sustainable Arab uh, community so that, you know, and, and then of course there'll be more immigrants later. But even in the 1940s and 50s, you go on Victor Avenue in Dearborn, they're speaking Arabic. So that's because of these people all coming from there. And that's where my story, um, ends for the most part. And that's where I'll end our, our comments today and have some conversation now. Edward, I have a question. You know, I've always been um, fascinated by these um, peddler networks um, of, um, of uh, you know, Muslims and particularly in the Midwest in, in the late 19th and early 20th century. But I've always wanted to know um, what kinds of, of, of goods were they selling door to door? So <clears throat> in Iowa in particular, they would often find out what the um, female farmers or the wives of male farmers, it was mostly the wives of the wives, the farm wives, wanted and couldn't get. And so if they knew they would have set roots and they would develop a relationship, you know, just uh, you and I are probably old enough to remember, you know, the, the, the vacuum people who would come around or whatever. Yeah. I mean, this yeah. is what would, so they would develop a relationship. Oh, you need canned goods. I'll go get you canned goods. You need, you need, now they were known in the press for selling bric-a-brac silks, um, needles and thread, any old kind of, um, it, 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 any kind of tchotchkes, sometimes that they said was from the Holy Land, from Palestine, 
you know, and Jerusalem, you know, uh, and they did do that. They did, they did do that. But the really, but the really successful ones would basically supply, you know, dry goods or whatever it is that the person would need, especially in rural America. In uh, in the cities, it would be um, it, it would be um, much more of this sort of bric-a-brac, you know, uh, threads and stuff. And then by the early 1900s, these peddlers are becoming dry goods store owners. And then with the the refrigeration revolution then and the and the corner grocery after world war one that then gives them an opportunity and everything they needed to know they already knew as peddlers they already had distribution networks they had credit to buy the food because they already had these um all of these uh, networks set up and so they so they so the peddling naturally went into the grocery store business i hope that answers your question yes yes See Christy. Yeah, uh, Edward, thanks so much for this. Like I said, I'm, I'm about maybe a third of the way into the book and it's just, it's so great. And I just, I realize how little I have known about the Muslim side of Syrian Lebanese history because my knowledge base is the Christian side. Most of my family members were Catholic or Lutheran because a lot of the Lebanese men, including my grandfather married a Swedish woman. So are all these like Swedish women marrying Lebanese men. And so one of the questions that I had for you was I, I, uh, Arabic was not passed down in my family. And I think there was just this internalization of assimilation and language. There was, there was shame, a, a lot of shame about the Arabic language, uh, in the al nabhani Nabhan family, at least. And I was wondering, my assumptions would be that the language would be a more crucial part within Islam, within the Muslim communities, especially because it's an intrinsic part of the faith. So I've been really curious about language. And also, this is just because I don't know, um, did the Muslim and Christian Syrian Lebanese communities interact? Because I know in my family, they were peddlers and there was a corner grocery store in Gary. My grandfather, great grandfather Farhat was a fruit peddler. And so I, a lot of the stories you're sharing, I'm like, yes, but I just, I think there's some real differences. I'm just wondering if you had any, oh, I know you have insight. So I'd love to hear your historical knowledge on that. So thanks. There were tensions, there were differences, but um, for the most part, these Arabic speaking peoples were more similar than different and, um, and their experiences. Now there was early on, one of the important things that, over time that developed was what you wanted to happen to the Arab lands after World War I, when the Ottoman Empire was defeated. Maronites tended, Maronite Christians tended to be very pro-Lebanese nationalism, whereas Melkite Christians, Orthodox, and the Muslims tended to be in favor of a greater Syria or an Arab nation, oftentimes in favor of the Sharifian solution, that is, for Prince Faisal to rule a, a united Arab nation that would today include Palestine, Jordan, Syria, uh, Lebanon, and perhaps Iraq. The French and the British, of course, disagreed with that. And so they divided up and created a separate Lebanon and, and Syria, Transjordan, and Palestine, and Iraq for that matter. Um, and uh, so, so that was one thing. So if you look at, if you go up to Cedar Rapids and you look at um, the current Lebanon um, exhibit, one of the things you'll see, it's, it, there's no English label. So you need to know Arabic in order to understand it. In the 1930s, in the big park in Cedar Rapids, there is a united for Syria youth of both Christians and Muslims getting together because in Iowa, the new, what was called the New Syria Party and other Arab American organizations were very active in trying to advocate against French and British imperialism and trying to convince their own country, the United States to say, this is not America. We cannot abide by this. Let the people decide, let them be independent, let them decide how they will rule themselves. And, um, and so, for, so there was, more political solidarity than you might expect among Christians and Muslims. Second, in Cedar Rapids, the women of St. George helped roll grape leaves for the women of the mother mosque 
and vice versa for their fundraisers. They would get together. Rolling grape, grape leaves is pretty is pretty uh, intense, and uh, and it takes a lot of time. A lot of a lot of these foods take a lot of time. So they would get together. They would have. Um, there were marriages. There were Christian Muslim marriages. I think that, in fact, in the book, I speculate it's possible that part of my family was Muslim. They married into a Christian family, and then the 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 Muslim part went away. Um, in terms of language, it is it depends on factors other than religion. Is there the infrastructure to teach kids how to read and write Arabic um, or not? Is there a critical mass of people with whom they can speak Arabic? Now, my family down in Cairo, Illinois, my mother can't can speak like just the words, uh, she can. She knows some cuss words and she knows the words of the food. That's it. So I went back starting when I was 18. I studied Arabic for six years and lived in the Middle East to try to become at least proficient. But uh, my grandmother could speak Arabic but she was Christian. She went, to, she went to St. Mary's College, which is right next to Notre Dame. And, um, and she, she could speak colloquial, but that was because she, her family had enough money to send her for three summers to Jebel Lubnan, to Mount Lebanon, to stay with the relatives. So it depends on, on resources. Um, what we know about uh, in Cedar Rapids, one of the most Islamically educated uh, people was um, from the um, Asi clan, or the um, um, spelled A-O-S-S-E-Y. And um, she was a woman who was trained by her Shia Muslim Sheikh father in Lebanon. And then she became a kind of religious authority around, you know, because she just knew more than anyone. And then that the children would study Arabic. Now with the second and third generation, if you think about it, whatever language is not English, it's not just a matter of shame. Uh, it can be certainly. But, um, you know, because there was huge Americanization efforts. Remember the Babel Proclamation in, in Iowa, where it, it becomes illegal for anyone to speak any language during World War I except for English. It didn't hold up over the long term. But, I mean, people are, are being sent to Fort Leavenworth for speaking German uh, and dying there. during. I mean, so there's, there is a huge... Uh, you know, the, the forces of the Klan and of uh, World War I nationalism really do pose a problem for people speaking any language. So the question is, does your community have the power and the resources to withstand that pressure, you know, and the critical mass? And uh, this is, I know this is a fairly long answer. I, I love language questions. But the, um, so again, you're going to see some variation across the region. Religion may play a factor in terms of is there, but I tell you, if you grew up in an Orthodox church, like up in Michigan City, uh, and you're connected to an Antiochian Orthodox church whose, whose headquarters is in Damascus, and you're, the head of your church speaks Arabic, is primarily an Arabic speaker, that you're still going to, there's still an opportunity there to speak Arabic. Arabic is still important because that's Oftentimes what people in the old country are still worshiping in Arabic. So that so it depends on your 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 diasporic connection as well to, to the old country. That's great. Thanks so much. That was such mm -hmm. a great thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yes, no, Edward, I'm, I'm very glad that um, you have finally cleared up this historical inaccuracy that Yvonne had dad have been circulating for decades and, um, you know, uh, in, in our work in Islam in America that, um, you know, the Cedar Rapids Mosque was the first mosque in the United States. I mean, a lot of us knew that this was wrong, um, but um, I'm, I'm glad that you have decisively um, cleared, that, cleared that up and, um, and what is your thinking about how, um, you know, that type of, of, of myth-making um, can happen in, um, you know, in a new field within religious studies? 
like Islam in America. And it kind of, um, you know, for a while, that idea was, was um, you know, kind of dominating the scholarship yeah. in the field. So, um, so I got to give full credit to Sally Howe, who really, um, all, her book, Old Islam in Detroit, is the one that really did the hard work on that Highland Park mosque. And she was the one. But of course, I, in this book, then what I do is, so Sally focuses only on Detroit. And what I did is I really, I used all those sources, like you're saying, Richard, the Sanborn insurance maps, the, the local newspapers, you know, every, um, the, um, because land has to trans, you know, uh, transfer, you know, change hands in order for, for a congregation to get built. And um, so, and oral histories, I used all of that in order to, to sort of get, you know, get the timeline together. Um, and what I think, you know, is that, and I'm not sure, I didn't realize, I think that Yvonne Haddad was the one who, <laughs> who had just retired, by the way, um, who, uh, who perpetuated that. Of course, people in Cedar Rapids, some of them will still insist on it. And they'll say, well, now um, I said, we're the they are the only one of all those mosques that still exists. So they still have a lot of, you know, a lot to be <laughs> proud of. I mean, none of those other buildings exist now. And so there's, so that, so there's that, and they're the longest, you know, um, they, they're probably not the longest operating, but they're, but the, none, you know, but that building exists. So um, in terms of the, um, I can tell you this, the people, if you read the letters in the archives from Ross, North Dakota to Cedar Rapids, they were already arguing back and forth uh, quite tenaciously at times about who had the first one. <laughs> I mean, so this is a lot. So this, you know, uh, as you know, it, it being the first is a very important part of claiming your stake in America, of saying we belong. And so it's, so that myth-making, I mean, think about, you know, um, whether we're talking about Black history or Anglo history or what, or ethnic, uh, some form, other form of ethnic history, you know, that, that the first is almost always, um, and, and part of Sally Howe's explanation for why it is that so much of the Muslim history of Syrian Lebanese people got erased. In, in her book, she argues that what happens is after 1965, the passage of the Hart Seller Bill brings in a whole new uh, generation, much larger number of Arabic speaking people to these communities. They oftentimes will take over the mosques that already exist in terms of control, because they're controlled democratically. They have the votes and there are more of them. And they look back on those Igrams who sold Miller Lite and Paps Blue Ribbon at their, um, at their grocery stores and say, they weren't actually Muslims. And then what happens is, so in Haddad's work and, and in um, Alexa Nass work, they're all called, they said, see, these were more social clubs. They weren't actually mosques. They were social clubs, they, and they weren't real Muslims. They weren't, because real Muslims, you know, would never take a, a sip of corn whiskey, you know, which is, you know, couldn't be further from the truth, of course. I mean, anybody who's lived in the Middle East and where alcohol is legal, you know, we, uh, there are plenty of Muslim drinkers. I mean, uh, just come to Jordan with me, I'll show you. But um, so, uh, but Christians own the uh, alcohol license, so uh, <laughs> at least in name. So the uh, so so they 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 basically they um, they came up with a mythic story that these people weren't Muslims because they had a different notion of what Muslim identity and practice meant. But part of the recovery project that Sally did in Detroit and now what I've tried to do in the Midwest is this was so central to their identity. We really erase a part of our own American past and a part of the Muslim past when we do not recognize just how important their Islamic identities were to them. So the, so, the, so the headline, in my view, for historians should be, isn't it remarkable that, that Arabic-speaking Muslims built so many mosques in this period, not which one was first or second or third?
So <clears throat> I have a question about food, if I, if I may ask. Yes, you mentioned please. stopping these uh, women getting together and stuff in great leaves. So were there any, um, I just interested in food uh, because I like to eat it. Uh, and I like to try different cuisines around in Iowa, right? I mean, are, first of all, did they, any of them open restaurants? Uh, were there restaurants and are there anything left of this? Uh, you can recommend a place to go and have some Arab food somewhere in the Midwest. So for sure, some of them opened, oftentimes they opened coffee houses and these were Arabic speaking places, sometimes out of the way um, they could be male dominated spaces and they would serve food to the borders. Um, so one man would cook for the other men oftentimes. Uh, in Cedar Rapids, I did not see, there were restaurants, I remember one or two or three, but I did not, nothing like the grocery stores. They really focused on the grocery stores and those grocery stores oftentimes became soda fountains in the 1950s across from Franklin School or one of the high schools. So, um, so in Cedar Rapids, I'm trying to think of, now I don't know about the Christians. They may, have, they may have opened other restaurants. Generally speaking, wherever these immigrants went, they, there were a few restaurants that were open. Uh, that was certainly the case here in Indianapolis and tons in Chicago. Um, but unfortunately, I, did, I can't think of one Muslim owned restaurant right now um, by name and tell you the location. That doesn't mean it wasn't there. Rebecca Hankins, is here. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, I, I, this is the second time I've heard you speak about this. And of course, I'm from that area too, Michigan, uh, Detroit. I lived in Detroit and Pontiac. And so, you know, there was always these intertwining communities that really knew each other because they worked in the factories. You know, my, my parents worked at, at Chrysler. Um, my mom was a union worker. So they were always, you know, um, moving in these things. They, they, they didn't interact um, closely or anything, but they were always, you always saw these various groups. So this is just always so, it just brings me back to when I was growing up in Detroit and, and uh, high, especially in Highland Park and, and Dearborn. But it, it's interesting to me because the, the whole idea, and I, I get into arguments all the time with Muslims about this, this whole notion of that pathway to social citizenship that was the military was something also that African-Americans uh, uh, saw, African-American Muslims uh, saw. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more. I know you talk a little, get into that a little bit more in your book, but could you talk about that a little bit more? That that mili the whole aspect of the military industrial complex as we noted note it now, and how that was the pathway that so many uh, ethnic groups, including African Americans, saw as. But uh, of course, it wasn't the same for African Americans. When they came back home, they were still being lynched and everything else, uh, facing oppression. Yeah, but... their political citizenship did not save them from exactly. white supremacy. Right. That's right. I want you to talk a little bit. <clears throat> but yes, I mean, until very recently, you know, the U.S. joining the U.S. military has been a traditional pathway since World War One to become a naturalized citizen of the United States. In World War One. Many of the Muslims who signed up uh, got a twofer because uh, on the one hand, uh, they uh, were gonna get citizenship in the United States. But on the other hand, they were supporting a military that was going to take down the Ottoman empire, which they opposed in their lands. They wanted to get rid of the Ottomans. So remember the, the, the powers in the, uh, the Austro-Hungarian empire, the Ottoman empire, you know, um, the uh, or um, you know the uh, the Germans uh, remember that you know versus the the French and the, the sides of the of the conflict so they're going to take down the Ottomans and so uh, now they some of them expressed uh, a um, a reservation about actually facing Muslims on the field they didn't want to go uh, in battle 
They didn't want to do that. But of course, most of them who served, whether from Cedar Rapids or from Michigan City or from uh, Detroit and Dearborn, uh, they served, um, you know, in the um, in France um, at the Muzargon. There are a lot, a lot of these Syrian Muslims, and I, in another book, I tell the story of some Syrian Muslims at the Muzargon, the the biggest battle of World War One, um, led by General um, Blackjack Pershing for the American Expeditionary Force, and so. Um, so they so so they get this this they get the citizenship they get to fight for freedom they are hoping that the that Wilsonianism will carry the day that that there will be a way that 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 their people back home will be able to determine their own futures and but they are deeply disappointed from from Sioux Falls to Michigan City when the Americans don't do more to oppose the French and British occupations of their homelands and they start organizing and they, you know, and, um, and they are, it's obvious they adopt and adapt the rhetoric of American nationalism to argue for self-determination in Syria and Lebanon and across the Arabic speaking world. Is that anything more on that? Yeah, I wonder, you know, because the um, one of the one of the um, areas that in my book that I expect to get some pushback on, since this is a, uh, a lecture on race and religion, is the idea of um, white racial identity for these Syrian Lebanese. And that's because most of the recent literature in Islamophobia has stressed, even in the court cases, that um, that that Muslims, if you think of uh, Khalid Beydoun's work and Sahar Aziz's work, that um, most uh, that these are based Muslims are always seen as a racialized inferior class, and um, I'm not denying that 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 those cases exist uh, of any sort. It's just that I think that the that that narrative, if we if it's a stag a static narrative that net you know. And that if it also makes the claim for the entire region of the Midwest, it doesn't hold up in all times and places. That it's more dynamic. And 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 you know one of the things that we haven't talked about here is colorism. So you know I'm half Arab. My my sister is uh, is, is 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 also half Arab. She's much lighter skin than I am. My mother is a much darker skin. You know, in our families, you know, we have dark and light skinned people in the same family. And that oftentimes determines your social citizenship, you know, as much as anything else. Like Christy and I, I don't know, are you half, Christy? More like a third, not a really. A third, half. okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, but, but, you know, um, but you can tell, I mean, you know, we're black, we're black, brown, and white Arabs are. And so, you know, so it's going to very much depend on, you know, that 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 color made all the difference in the world to how I was perceived growing up in rural southern Illinois. And I know during a uh, Cairo, Illinois, if any of you all know Cairo, Illinois, when my mother was growing up in the 40s and 50s, woo, you know, uh, you know that, you know, there was, you know, she could not pass as a white person. So, um so it's so there's also there's a great deal of variety here that we have to account for. Mm -hmm. um, this is where I resist sometimes the I, the current contemporary um, stress on Muslim as a race. I agree that that can be useful, but I also want to push back because I still think that blackness is the index against which racial identity is oftentimes formed in social and legal matters in the United States. You know, I, I think what you're saying is is very, very important because, you know, I, I'm not sure how this has how this has shifted. But there is now, a, you know, a, um, a racial category. And of course, racial categories are constructed by the United States government. They're not constructed by um, oftentimes by people who live these identities. But there is now a racial category of Middle Eastern white. So, um, you know. And, you it, know, our community is fighting really hard for that, to get that category on the census, the main uh, category, Middle East, North Africa. 
but it, because yeah, go ahead. But I think that that is important because you know there are a, a, a lot of um, um, people who are um, you know who are from India and Pakistan who have very very brown color of skin, but they you know they are classified as 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 white people by U.S. government um, uh, classifications and. I make a point to my students when we talk about um, racial categories that that actually does make a difference. When you go to a bank to apply for a loan, it makes a difference if you try to integrate a neighborhood because, um, and, and so I'm not, I, I guess my question is how these categories of, um, of various, um, non-African, uh, African-American Muslims, um, how these categories, these racial categories get constructed, how they have changed over, over time. Because I know there, that there was the historic uh, decision sometime in the 1920s where uh, the Muslims, uh, people of, of Muslim descent I believe um, from um, from India were ruled as um, you know as as non-white people. That's correct. There was the famous court case. Yeah, there was the Singh case too, where they yeah, said, yeah, and, and, right. and, and basically not, the court he said he doesn't person. he doesn't look white, so it's common sense. That's what the, that's what the court said. <laughs> but I'm I'm interested in how these um, how these um, categories of um, of, of non-African American Muslims, um, their, these racial categories get constructed and reconstructed over time by the U.S. government. And you know what is the rationale for the U.S. government? Um, and what I would say is, you know, I, you know, this is my ambivalence about using Muslim as a racial category. Is and I understand again. I mean, it, I think it, it follows kind of in the line of Hannah Arendt and you know, um, and looking, you know, and, and, and looking in particular at how Jews are treated by the Nazi regime as a race, but they were really talked about scientific, like scientific racism actually said that, you know, used, uh, you know, um, racial categories to talk about Jews, whereas most of the anti-Muslim animus that is coming is not actually talking about Muslims as a, as a, um, a biological or phenotypical Kind of race in the way that we're that we're the way we're used to, and so um, so so instead of you know instead of only abusing that as the dominant paradigm, what what I would look at anti-Muslim animus, you know, from being produced by government policies and just put a slightly different label on it. I don't know why you know the the um, I think Islamophobia as a, as which is which is not. Uh, well regarded by many academics at this point, but is still a useful, just like anti-Semitism was a, was a kind of banner, you know, um, just like we use racism, which really oftentimes is indexed to black people, even if we don't, even if we don't say anti-black racism. And I, I think, you know, and, but we could replace it, that's fine. But I need a category to explain how it is that since the colonial era, Muslims have represented a population for uh, the, not the government so much, but important you know, institutions. And then later in the Barbary, the first two foreign wars of the United States, yeah. as you know, the Barbary against the Barbary pirates in North Africa, right? Those are the first two foreign wars that the United States engages in. I need a category that explains the constellation of danger that's associated with this foreign population. It combines elements of xenophobia, of racism, right? Of, and it, it seems to me it's worthy of its own category. So that's how I, you know, that's how I look to it. And, and once we have that, whatever, I still use the term Islamophobia, what we can see is, you know, the construction, the different kinds of construction of Islamophobia, which get better and worse depending on the era, right? Um, but are especially become especially important after the Iranian revolution of 1979. 
this is the this is really in terms of our contemporary and this produces the scholarship you know Edward Said wrote a wonderful book called covering Islam in which he looks at all the centers of interpretation the media the academy the think tanks political lobby groups and other centers of interpretation which produce the stereotypes that that are then applied to Muslims as a group in the post 9/11 construction of the war on terror which is which is a war on Muslims in all but name, right? I mean, who gets killed in the war on terror? Come on. Uh, I mean, let's, let's be a little more honest. About it. And it reminds you, for anybody who's studied the Cold War, you remember that, um, uh, that Condi Rice, she was a Sovietologist. And if you read uh, George Keenan and, and all of the people who manufactured the Cold War, Condi Rice is using exactly the same kinds of terms to define the threat posed by Muslims to the United States and the West in post 9-11 America. And for those of us who are historians, it's like, woo, it was like, you know, plus ça change. It was like, I can't, I'm seeing another Cold War being constructed right before my eyes. So that's in just a couple comments uh, in response to your you know, to the government's role in creating this is whatever we're going to call it. I call it Islamophobia. Dr. Howard. Hi, Ed. I'm so glad I finally got to see you. Um, I feel like we've been missing each other for quite some time. And I just want to ask this question, and I apologize. I had a prior engagement, so I couldn't make it for your talk. But I just wanted to ask this question because I know there are some graduate students in the room um, who are thinking about these big questions and particularly how we think about Muslims and how they've been stereotyped and really how revolutionary it is, right? And not only a reclamation of these people's stories in the Midwest, but in challenging how we think about the region, right? And there's a little newsletter that circulates around Iowa City and I got one on Friday and it said that 4.1% of Iowans are farmers and 4.5% of Iowans are black. But we don't think of Iowa as a black state, right? But it becomes this kind of quintessential pastoral place. So what does it mean when we're constantly grappling and thinking about what this region may, means, particularly in how we shape our national myths, our stereotypes, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, et cetera? I was hoping you could speak to that point. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that. And it is a pleasure to see to be connected to you more directly someday in person, uh, if the crick don't rise, inshallah. Uh, and um, so uh, this is um, what I call my most meaningful contribution in the book. And I, I start the I start the book. The intro starts with the story of my own family. And um, and so. Um, rather than making uh, a grand historiographical intervention, um, I'm still, I actually want to appeal to hearts in the heartland. Um, and um, you know who helped me though really realize this was one of my readers. I don't know if you know her. She's the most wonderful, uh, she's one of the most wonderful Iowans I know, Madupe Labode. She grew up in Iowa, Nigerian American, she now works uh, at the National Museum of uh, American History in DC. And um, she's a, yet another black Iowan who proves, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, I love you sometimes wear your t-shirt, right? Yes, there are black people in Iowa. Um, what's the outfit that makes those t-shirts? Uh, Ray gun. Yes, yes, I, I've got mine says, uh, uh, Clear Lake is the Hamptons of Mason City. So um, anyway, so uh, for those of you who know Iowa. Okay, so, so I say Madupe Laboda really helped me. A lot of my readers encouraged me, said, you know, go ahead, be personal. Actually, it was the two Midwesterners who, <laughs> and Rana Razik from Wichita, Kansas, uh, daughter of Arab immigrants. And they said, yeah, yeah, you got to make it personal. And I said, you know, I shared why writing this book was so important to me. Look. I grew up, I don't know how you grew up, but I really did grow up thinking that I was a foreign intrusion in an essentially white land. I, I, because people always ask me, because race is so important, what are you, what are you, what are you? I wasn't white, 
people thought maybe it was a little black. I didn't have a foreign accent, so I couldn't be, you know, you know, ethnic in that way. So I was a real conundrum to people. What are you? What are you? What are you? It was the question of my youth, not who are you? What are you? And by writing this, this by going back into the Midwestern past and, and, re, and discovering Muslim, Syrian Muslims in, in every, all across the region, including in its small towns, which we associate, of course, historiographically, but also mythologically with the heartland. It's not, I mean, we will keep reading Detroit and Chicago into Midwestern history, but in the end, the myth is with the small town. But there were Muslims there too. And so, you know, I just say, we, we have got, it's just, this stops now. We have never, never been all white and all Christians from the time that there were, the native peoples spoke different languages, practiced what today we would call different religious uh, practices. You know, from the very earliest migrants, um, there were, have always been Afro-Eurasian people across our region. We have never been all white. And, 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 if, and part of reclaiming our region from white supremacy is telling a new story about who we have been. So that, you know, so, and I, and, and that's why the efforts of you and so many of us, you know, who are part of local history associations and state history associations and doing public history, you know, this is essential, I think. Now, I still don't know, just to be frank, if we're gonna win. Things are very bad. And we know, you know, if, if we know the African-American history of the Midwest and of the whole country, Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. And um, in the 1920s, the KKK's rise in the region, especially in this state, yeah, I mean, it swept away the kind of diversity, rewriting, making possible the idea that our 100% American region was white and Christian and Protestant. Um, that myth seems to obtain with so many people. I, I know a lot of people in Iowa because I married an Iowa family. And they said, no, no, we never had any of this diversity is all new. We've never had black people in Iowa. We never had, uh, uh, you know, we've never had Asians in Iowa, you know, and, and I just, so um, I hope that this is a place where those of us who are historians can challenge the everyday racism of removal, of forgetting. So that's, I don't know if that's uh, a historiographically complex response, but that's what I think. You know, I have a larger um, question about your book is one of the points that you're trying to make in your book is, is it that in the um, very early 20th century that these um, Syrian Muslims found uh, uh, both a racial and a religious safety zone um, you know, from um, from Islamophobia and, um, and and racism in these small heartland towns. Well, they, in Cedar Rapids, they could. Um, in terms of, but their congregations, I'm saying, were that were that kind of became that kind of safety zone. Uh, they still faced great social discrimination out in their towns, including towns where there were figures who. Um, uh, who actually supported them. I document the Islamophobia that they still faced in those towns. Is that, but so it was this and that, it wasn't either or. So I don't want to try to make it a utopian kind of, you know. Yeah, it, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and I, and I think I don't. I think I, 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 I think I bring up enough of the discrimination, you know, and how, um, for example, I mean, I, I point out that in Sioux Falls, there was a, I mean, there was, there was violence against Muslims, Syrians, and they never, they, even though they had a really grand start to their community organizing, they never established a mosque. And I, and, um, and I think, um, you know, one of the reasons they didn't is, is there was just too much, you know, and Sioux Falls is was such a different town in the twenties than Cedar Rapids. And okay. you talk about, if you look at the number of African-Americans and and and, uh, and, um, not, and white ethnics, very small, incredibly small. This was a very waspy town. Uh, now that doesn't mean they didn't like their jazz. They still, you know, they 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 love their jazz. But 
we all know just because you have black people performing in your town does not mean that you're a, a nice place for black people to live. Yes, Christy, I see your hand. Yeah, thanks. You know we're coming to our the end of our time together. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't want to dominate, but I just I love your work so much. And I, you know, as you mentioned earlier, I'm I'm personally invested in this work, your work, and and I have plans for the next project. Um, one of the things I really appreciate about your work, um, Ed, is that it's it's public facing humanities work. And there's a, there are an increasing number of us here, uh, including my colleague, uh, Ashley, Dr. Howard here, a wonderful colleague in history on uh, AFAM studies, whose work is, is public facing, you know, and mm -hmm. we do write for a wide audience and feel like there are primary interlocutors and feel a sense of ethical responsibility, right? And I love how you started your talk today with your, your theorist was your, your, your primary theorist was your grandmother. And I just really applaud you for that because, you know, I'm one of those scholars who I love theory. I love high theory, but I tend to put that in my, my academic articles rather than the books. And I just really appreciate how you are centering. You've always centered your interlocutors, historical and contemporary and, and you center their epistemologies and their ways of knowing. And we don't need a French theorist, you know, um, who's been dead for a long time to tell us, you know, why, why those stories are important. So I just want to commend you for that. And a related question to my observation is, I'm wondering, like, you know, what feedback have you gotten? Have you received feedback from the communities you've worked with? Um, I'm always curious about that. I mean, I know you gave a talk in Cedar Rapids recently and at Iowa State, so if you could just share with us some of the feedback you've gotten and, and how that's worked out. So thanks. Yeah, th no, thank you so much for that supportive word. I, I must admit, I have trepidation about the reviews of the book uh, because it, it's not, it does not tackle some of the theoretical questions that are au courant in Arab American studies, um, which are really focused more on migration or what, or what Tom Tweed would call a crossing rather than dwelling, rather than homemaking. And, and I'm really focusing on homemaking here. How, do, how did these people make a home? And, uh, you know, and it sounds more like a more traditional assimilation tale, even though I'm talking about the preservation of their, of their religious culture and identity. But um, so I'm not, <laughs> we'll see what happens there. I'm a little scared. Um, you know, um, I mean, I do think that there is a kind of, <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's a, it's it's a bit challenging, even with someone like me. I mean, this is my what my twelfth book, you know. But I still, you know, you still, you, you, I worry sometimes, frankly, that I cut myself off in a way from colleagues when I'm not speaking their theoretical language. But what I do know is that what makes this all worth it is I had no idea that this book would become the passport for me to connect to so many people, especially Midwesterners, both Muslim and not. And I mean, I was at the Lincoln Library last week. The, the crowd was deep, you know, it, you can tell when an audience is invested in what you're talking about. We know that as teachers. In Cedar Rapids, it was overwhelming. Uh, they invited me to spend the whole next day with them. I, 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 I hang out with 15 different people, went to different sites. I tweeted about it some. And then I got to meet the widow of one of the main characters in my book, who's 92 years old, and got to speak Arabic and English with her in her home and see the family Quran. As, and um, it was, if nothing else, if I don't get anything else from this book, and even if I'm pummeled, the kind of reception, the kind of connection, the kind of love, frankly, that was shared with me by people in Cedar Rapids, by Muslims in Cedar Rapids, made the whole thing worth it. And, uh, and I, I, I told them I'll, I'll cherish it for the rest of my life. That's awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think this is a, a, a great note to, <laughs> to end this uh, uh, talk on. I think the, what you talked about here was really captivating. It was a great discussion. And 
I personally have been inspired to get a copy of your book because even though I work in Chinese Buddhism, I think <laughs> I would like to get something out of it. So, <laughs> so thank, thank you, so, you much. so much for having uh, me, everyone. It was a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great job. It's a beautiful thank book. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks for being here. <laughs>